An Odd Boy, Volume 1, by Nat Chang Rinpoche. Chapter 4, Part 3. Mrs Pendrake always had some moral instruction to impart that had nothing to do with Bible studies. Every lesson included some pompous morality tale and warnings about counterculture. Beatniks would go to hell when they died. Long hair was the work of Satan or some such thing. Lindsay would invariably roll her eyes during such discourses. It bugged Lindsay when Mrs Pendrake questioned us as to our belief in Jesus. When asked if I believed in Jesus, I'd say, Yes, I believe in Jesus. He was a great man. I just don't believe in God. And I don't think Jesus would have liked the church. That did not go down well, to say the least. I was told I was a stupid, ignorant boy whose parents would be ashamed of him. I thought that was more than likely true. The more I heard about Jesus, however, the more I admired him. He seemed totally different from the God he represented. Lindsay agreed. I wonder why the church is closed-minded when Jesus was not that way at all. I thought about it for a while and answered, well, Jesus is not around to see what they've done to the things he taught. By the end of the third year, Lindsay had had enough of Mrs Pendrake and with the agreement of her parents and the headmaster, she sat out of the lessons. I would have been inclined to have done the same, but for the fact that I wanted to go to art college and needed four or five O-levels to go on and take A-levels at another school. Mysteriously, I always got good marks in religious education, and so I was stuck with Mrs Pendrake, even though I was an atheist. Lindsay wrote poetry as she sat in the lobby waiting for Mrs Pendrake's class to finish. Too many wasps and too many flies, too many tell-tales, too many lies. Too many murders, too many killings, too many dentists and too many fillings. Too many mistresses, too many masters, too many chances that end in disasters. Too many motorbikes, too many scooters, too many teachers and too many tutors. Too many colds and too many flus, too many sulks and too many blues. Lindsay Golding, Too Many, 1965. Although I recognised I was an atheist, I wondered whether I could believe in Jesus without believing in God. I'd read books about Tibet and the people there who had special powers. Jesus was obviously like one of those people, as far as I could see, because he could walk on water. Some people said that Jesus went to Tibet in the period of his lost time. But Mrs Pendrake had an extremely big problem with that notion. I wondered if you could be an atheist vicar. I didn't see it was necessary to believe in God if you wanted to follow what Jesus taught. I liked the way he waded into the temple and cleared out the money changers. Jesus was the genuine article and I wished there was a religion that followed him. That idea fell flat on its face. I imagine that if I'd met a real Christian, I might be a vicar now. But at the time, all I saw was lip service, disingenuousness and hypocrisy. While still at infant school, I'd given one of my father's coats to a tramp who turned up at the door asking for a handout. It was January. He looked frozen 
and my father had a fair few coats. I had no money to give him and thought the coat would help him. I chose what I thought was the least attractive coat. I had some sartorial sense even then because I didn't want my father to lose something valuable. I thought this was an appropriate response because I'd heard the vicar, the vicar give a sermon on the Good Samaritan. I thought that was how we were supposed to be. We believed in Jesus, didn't we? I was wrong. The English believed in Jesus and what he said when it suited them. The story of the Good Samaritan was somehow something from the Bible. And although it was a good story, it couldn't be applied as I'd applied it. I failed to comprehend that, but I easily comprehended my father's Sam Brown belt as it was applied to my buttocks. The message from God was clear. We're having none of that beatnik Christianity in this house. Yes, indeed, Jesus was a beatnik and that's why I liked him. My mother wasn't a beatnik, but she was a real Christian. She was a magic Christian. She was never big on theology, though, so I couldn't discuss religious matters with her too much. I was fascinated by religion, but I became increasingly enervated by the religious instruction class. It was not possible to discuss anything or to explore the meaning of the ideas in the Bible, so I stopped making any comment. There was no purpose in attempting to make the class educational with Mrs Pendrake in command. Lindsay had had the right idea, but I couldn't follow suit as I didn't have enough other subjects to escape as she had done. I didn't care one way or the other what Mrs Pendrake thought of me. I didn't care what most of the teachers thought of me. I became increasingly disinterested in school. I disliked arithmetic and loathed mathematics. Art had great value, but this number crunching was just a complicated game that people played. My father liked that kind of thing, so I had no reason to warm to it. Numerical subjects had almost nothing to do with life. I could see the purpose of rulers and counting your change, but beyond that it had no worth. History and geography had significance because they helped a person understand the world. More to the point, however, was that through history I could tell the girls what happened in 1066, apart from Harold of Wessex being defeated by William of Normandy. In 1066, King Hardrada of Norway invaded England. 300 ships arrived, defeated an army and took York. Unfortunately, Harold's army took Harald Hardrada by surprise at Stamford Bridge. It was a hot day. The Vikings had shed their sarks and so Harold devastated them. When I read this, I was all set to tell the girls how England was lost to Odin and Thor because the Vikings shed their sarks. Lindsay was intrigued and wrote a piece about the sun being an enemy. The skylark rose into the air. The sun was glinting gold. The skylark sank, a shriveled speck, and now the sun is glaring white. The emerald grass now brittle and dried, the leaves of trees have withered and died. The trunks have shriveled, scarred with black, the flowers dead beside the track. 
and now in every city and town the houses are shambles tumbled down. I can't stand the heat. I can't stand on my feet. I crawl hands and knees grovelling the ground, my head spinning faster, faster round. Oh, for the shadow, the shade, oh, the heat, the sooner the better my death will I meet. Oh, for the ball of fire to be banished and leave me to try to forget and vanish from my mind all the dread of the days, one by one, when the earth was burnt up by the glaring white sun. Lindsay Golding, The Glaring White Sun, 1963. It was wonderful to be relating creatively with my friend Lindsay, and I naively thought this was something even my male classmates would find interesting. I said to the boys, but these fellows, these bearsarks or berserkers, would get battle crazed. They would run into battle naked and everyone who knew what was good for them would get out of the way. They were the only ones who never took battle wounds. We could not fathom each other. What lunatic Norsemen did a thousand years ago was of no interest to them. Steve was always interested. But then he was a reader and interested in a wide variety of subjects. I found it fascinating that the word berserk came from the word berserker, which came from the word bearsark, which meant being bare of one's sark and running into battle naked. The berserkers would eat Amanita muscaria and imagine themselves invincible. Sometimes they were. Amanita muscaria, also known as fly agaric, is a strikingly beautiful mushroom, red, speckled with white. It is probably the oldest known hallucinogen. The history of Amanita muscaria is associated with shamanism and magical practices. Amanita muscaria mushrooms are now known mainly as the mushrooms in fairy tales, but they are real enough. I saw some in Norway in 1986, coming down from the Hardangavida into Oslo. History was crammed with incredible accounts, and the girls in my class, always intrigued by what I might discover next, encouraged me to pillage the library for further material. I was fascinated with the world, but not with football boots. Santa Claus is a hippie drug freak from Lapland. It's true, no word of a lie. I told Lindsay about it. Lindsay was incredulous, but intrigued. Lap shamans dress in red and white to reflect the Amanita muscaria mushroom. The reindeer come into the picture as living filters. Amanita muscaria apparently gives a human being severe stomach cramps, but reindeer are able to digest them without bad effects. Lindsay mused, how does that make Santa Claus a drug freak? I was in my element. Well, here comes the strange part. If someone drinks reindeer urine some time after the reindeer has eaten the mushrooms, they get the hallucinogenic effects without the cramps. Now who'd have thought of that? Lindsay shrieked with mirth and said, I wouldn't for starters. You wouldn't do that, would you? No, now it was my, my turn to laugh. No, but I'm glad someone does. It makes the world such an interesting place. Then I went on to tell her that the psychoactive ingredient is also available from the urine of other shamans. Fantastic story, Vic, but they can keep it to themselves. 
I was fascinated to learn how culture, values and ideas were linked and distorted across time. The things people believed and took for granted were actually some kind of kaleidoscope image. Santa Claus could just as easily come up from the bottom of the sea on a hammerhead shark wearing a rhinoceros skin boiler suit and manta ray cape, I suggested, if it was a normal part of life to have that as an image. No one would question it. I've not really looked at it that way, Lindsay replied, but yes, it's all very weird, isn't it? Life's just so strange. Mind you, you're pretty strange too. I thanked her for her compliment and she burst out laughing. People are amazing. There's no obvious direction from A to B, is there? I asked. Lindsay looked quizzical. I mean, in deciding to drink reindeer urine. It had to be lunatic guesswork. The fact that yeast makes bread rise can happen by accident, but you can't accidentally drink reindeer urine. Lindsay agreed. You can't even drink it on the off chance that something strange might happen. I thought about that for a moment and replied, or maybe you can. I don't have that kind of mind, but good luck to those who do. Lindsay asked, what happens after the shamans drink the urine? I held forth. The shamans would have visions and then go visiting. In Lapland, they had their front doors in the roofs. You'd have to come in through a smoke hole. This is how the story of Santa Claus started. It wasn't really a chimney. It was a ladder and the shaman came down it with gifts but the gifts were visions. It was a long story, but the gist of it was that the crazed old drug fiend would bundle through the smoke hole and tell wild tales of who knows what. The story made Lindsay chuckle. It must have been those long dark nights or something. I thought she was probably right on that score and added... The whole story of Santa Claus flying through the night sky on a reindeer sleigh is about this. Even Rudolph. Lindsay spluttered with hilarity at that point. Rudolph? No. What? So I explained. Yes, Rudolph. It's the red nose. That's all part of it. That's one of the effects. The mushroom causes you to blush violently all around your nose. Lindsay looked at me sideways. And this is all true? It was and is all true. The salient point for me was that if you scratch the surface of the ordinary, apparently mundane world, there'd be a wealth of fantastic discoveries below it. Who'd have thought that conservative 60s parents encourage their children to believe in a drug freak from the Arctic Circle?